Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, may I request everyone to please take their seats so we can start today's event. Thank you all very much for joining us today uh, for the launch of India in a Warming World, Integrating Climate Change and Development, a volume edited by Professor Navroz K. Dubash. Uh, the volume comprehensively covers a very wide range of uh, issues relating to climate change uh, in India and brings together some of the leading voices in the field. I'm sure we'll hear a lot about it uh, in the event today. So we've planned the, today's event in two parts. In the first part, I'll request Navroz to introduce the volume and then invite some of our authors who are here with oh, us yes. today, along with the panelists, to release yes. the book. Uh, in the second part, we'll have a discussion uh, with our panelists, moderated by Navroz. That will be for about 40 to 45 minutes, uh, followed by an engagement with the audience. So uh, before I invite Navroz, I have to say a few lines about him, <laughs> although he's no stranger to any of us in the room today. Uh, Navroz is a professor at the Center for Policy Research, where he leads the uh, Initiative on Climate, Energy, and Environment. He's one of the foremost authorities, both in India and globally, on climate change policy and governance. Uh, he's currently a coordinating lead author for the National Policies and Institutions chapter in the upcoming sixth assessment report for the IPCC. So over to you, Navroz. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Shibani. That was... Uh, um I think I asked Shibani to please be even briefer on the on the bio, but but she took some license. Um, thank you, thank you, Shibani, and thank you all. It's really really very nice to see all of you in the room here. Uh, lots of uh, old friends and some and some um, uh, new people. I look forward to meeting. Um, as Shibani said, uh, we're going to try and spend a little bit of time introducing the book, uh, but save the bulk of the time for a discussion with our panelists. And we have a great panel uh, that that we'll we'll talk about uh, in a minute and introduce uh, in a minute. So I thought I would just very quickly talk about why we did this book, how we did it, and maybe some of the key themes uh, that we hope will carry forward in this conversation. Um, so, so very briefly, why this book? Now, I think we've had a long uh, period of discussion around climate change in India, at least from the period of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change in 1990. We have people in the room who were there uh, at the beginning. In fact, I think that's the title of Ambassador Daskupta's chapter. Um, uh, and for a long period, for two decades or so, uh, the discussion about climate change in India has been tied to the discussion about equity and the role of equity in climate change. And that has been a very important and continues to be a very important part of the discussion. But there's also a sense in which there are other strands that have come to join this discussion that is based on growing evidence and perception that for India, climate change is important in a sense, even from a developmental point of view. And that's based on increasing evidence of India's vulnerability. So how do we talk about India's own vulnerability to climate impacts? Uh, it pertains to the global context for our development choices. So if India uh, has to pursue much more energy, which we do, that context globally for energy is shaped by the climate debate, uh, by push for new technologies, by the rise of solar, by pressures for investor transparency around exposure to climate policy risk and so on. And there are increasingly, there's increasingly evidence of links between various things that we are extremely concerned about from a development point of view and climate change itself, air quality being one example. Uh, so, you know, what we've also seen, even from an administrative point of view, is if you look at the administrative landscape in India, there are now climate cells that have popped up all over the place. And this is the chapter that Shibani uh, actually led in, our, in the book. There's a nice diagram showing all this sort of proliferation of climate cells. What do those cells do and what does it mean? What does it mean for the future of India's administrative uh, uh, approach to, to, to climate change? And so given all these bits and pieces of, of evidence, the core question for the book is not whether India should be engaging climate change, but how. And how is not actually a straightforward question to ask uh, or to answer. So what the book tries to do is frame the, the challenge of India's engagement with climate change. The broad framing is that we need to be thinking about it in, it in ways that integrate climate change and development, hence the subtitle. And that is what the papers in the book try and bring uh, to the conversation. Uh, not whether we should engage, but how, and how we should engage in a way that takes seriously India's uh, development, uh, development challenges. So how did we write this book? Well, in, in, in one sense, uh, 
the obvious thing to do was to pull together the very rich knowledge and experience in the country. We have a lot of authors, I should say, from outside Delhi as well. Uh, and one of them, Veena, has just flown in to join us. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is Veena Srinivasan. Uh, and we have several authors from Delhi uh, in the room. Um, we had 37 authors uh, collectively. And my job was really just to convene uh, on occasion cajole, and it must be said on even rarer, but, uh, but there were some occasions where I had to coerce. Uh, and everybody actually succumbed very uh, gracefully to 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 uh, to to all of these uh, efforts. So we have policymakers, very distinguished policymakers uh, in the room. Uh, we have uh, academics. We have civil society representatives of civil society organizations, practitioners, and several people actually can't really be defined and put in any of these boxes, and they 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 really straddle these these categories. So the idea was to try and bring together the range of voices, people who have been extremely prominent uh, in the discussion, uh, at, at, at really at the highest levels of government. I mentioned Ambassador Das Gupta. There's also Ambassador Saran sitting, uh, sitting here in front of me, who was, um, of course, the Prime Minister's special envoy. And, and so it's really, really uh, quite amazing for us to have had this level of representation uh, in the book. Um, the way in which we organized uh, the book was around five broad themes. So the starting point was really impact. So there's a section on impacts, uh, including some very cutting edge uh, material. Uh, there is a section on the international debates, which is where this conversation started, but I would argue which is perhaps not the center of gravity of the conversation quite anymore. Uh, but it is, uh, continues to, of course, be a, a very important piece. And we went beyond, we covered the UNFCC, but we went beyond it to look at issues like HFCs uh, and uh, 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 aviation and so on and so forth. I will say that this section, one of the things that I think is, uh, which I'm, I'm really, really, uh, I think is, is one of the biggest selling points of the book, is we have contributions here from Ambassador Dasgupta, who led our negotiations in the Framework Convention, Ambassador Saran, who led it in Copenhagen, and Mr. Lavasa, who led it in Paris. These are first-person accounts uh, of recollections. So, so you know, as a, when I was a student, I would have loved to have been able to read this sort of uh, this sort of material, and I really hope that today's students will 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 take advantage uh, take advantage of this. Uh, and then we have many more uh, uh, sort of excellent chapters uh, as well, including by my. Uh, by my colleague Lavanya Rajamani, who's one of the foremost uh, international lawyers uh, on the topic. The book then goes on to talk about the politics and the policy of climate change. And so, for example, in the politics, we've looked at perspectives from the business community. We've also looked at perspectives from labor. And that, again, is something new. I haven't seen writing from the labor community about their perspectives uh, on climate change. In the policy area, we cover some of the well-worn ground, the national action plan, the state action plans, but also institutions, finance, uh, technology. And then the section that I think uh, uh, is probably where the conversation is headed is the final section, which is titled Climate and Development, which is where the question of how you integrate these two issues comes together. And we have organized that along sectors, because in a sense, the governance process is organized around sectors. And we need to find a way to integrate usefully climate change into energy discussions, water discussions, agriculture discussions, coastal discussions, uh, and, and so on. So that's where that final uh, section lands. So collectively, there is a lot of diversity in the volume by design. But it also leads to a few pointers for future conversation. Uh, and I'm not sure all the authors would agree 100% with this, but they would probably be comfortable with my putting it out as one of the ways to talk about, uh, about the, the, the multiplicity of, of points of view. So let me just end with sort of two or three broad points which we can pick up in the, in the panel discussion uh, that follows. Uh, one of the themes that comes through, particularly in that last section, is that if we are thinking about climate change through a development lens, then we have to understand that this is a problem that has multiple objectives and simultaneous objectives. So mitigation might be an objective, adaptation certainly, but for the line ministries, it's going to be dominated by things like energy access, energy security, uh, 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 resilience in the case of agriculture, and so on and so forth. So there are multiple objectives, and that's a complex thing to manage a problem when you have multiple objectives. And simultaneously, there are multiple stressors uh, 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 at play. Uh, so for example, the chapter on water talks about um, uh, 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 multiple uses of water in cities like Bangalore, uh, industrial pollution. Uh, issues around, uh, around land subsidence. All of these are, are related to immediate stresses on water 
that may not actually originate in climate change, but climate change is an additional factor. So multiple objectives and multiple stresses is one theme. The second is to explore what the linkages are, both the synergies as well as the, as, as well as the trade-offs between climate and development. We can't assume there are always synergies. Sometimes there will be trade-offs. So policy has to actually take account uh, of both. Um, the third, then, is that given the complexity of this challenge, we have to have governance and institutional systems that are up to that task of dealing with this complexity. And so how do we design our governance systems and our institutional arrangements in ways that, that reflect uh, the complexity? And finally, our approach to diplomacy, then, needs to be guided by this new, more complex reality uh, that India faces when it comes to climate change, that includes vulnerability, that includes the intersection, sometimes synergy, sometimes uh, 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 trade-offs, uh, and so on. So that's, those are sort of a few larger themes that, that I would put out there. I don't want to claim by any means that this is sort of a, a unanimous uh, view of the authors. It's my effort at distilling some points, but the chapter that says this is only under my name. Uh, so, so that's a very important, uh, important uh, uh, caveat. Um, and I, again, I think we'll take this forward in the in the uh, in the panel discussion. So, before um, I we move on with the with the program, I just want to uh, thank several people. You know, these thank yous that that are saved till the end of the program. I find you know it's it's sort of everybody's ready to go, and thank yous are important. So, I'm putting them at, at the beginning of the of the program. Uh, I want to start by actually thanking all of the authors for, for bearing with, with some uh, persistent and repeated emails over what is now two and a half odd years. Uh, so thank you to, to all the authors in this room and uh, by extension to all the authors in different parts of India and in fact overseas. I also want to thank uh, Mr. Nitin Desai who wrote a foreword who unfortunately can't be here today. Uh, it's a little under the weather. Uh, and also want to mention Mahesh Rangarajan, who is very useful uh, as a sounding board at various stages in this process. Uh, also appreciate OUP and their efforts in getting out this volume, which is both hefty but yet surprisingly light. Uh, I'm not quite sure how they pull that off, but I, it, it helps. Uh, I want to acknowledge and thank the MacArthur Foundation uh, in particular, who funded this work. And they are, I think, quite unique as funders because they're willing to fund work that isn't necessarily instrumental, that is about promoting and informing debate. And I, and I think that's a very valuable, uh, uh, valuable role that they, that they play. And then not least by any means, my colleagues in CPR, um, including Madhura Joshi, Parth Bhatia, Mandakini Chandra, Aditya Pillay, Ankit Bharadwaj, and Indupal, uh, and, and many others who have really uh, you know, done a lot of the legwork in making this volume possible and a lot of the brain work in making it possible. So, so thank you all very much. So that was the sort of opening introduction to, to end this bit of the, of, of the program. I think we, you know, book releases seem to call for some ceremony, so we'll try and keep the ceremony as painless as possible. Uh, what our, our design is that we're going to actually ask the panelists to come up and help us release this. But I also would like to invite all the authors in the room to please come up uh, and, 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 uh, and you know, have your face visible. And uh, you know, I'm sure you're all willing to stand by your work. So please, uh, if you all could come up here, and we'll do a, a quick joint release, and then we will uh, move on to the, the conversation part of the program. Thank you, everyone. Uh, may I now request our panelists? OK, they're here already. Uh, before I hand over to Navroz, if I could just do a quick round of introduction for our uh, panelists today. Uh, Ms. Nena Lal Kidwai, uh, she was the chairperson of HSBC India and executive director on the board of HSBC Asia Pacific. She currently serves on the boards of various corporations. She was the president of FICI. Uh, she's a member of the Rockefeller Foundation's Economic Council on Planetary Health and serves as a commissioner on the Global Commission on e Economy and Climate. She was previously a member of the in International Advisory Council of the UNEP and the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on Climate Change. Welcome, Ms. Kidbai. Uh, Chandra Bhushan, he is the CEO of the International Forum for Environment, Sustainability, and Technology, iForest, an independent nonprofit environmental research and advocacy organization based in New Delhi. Uh, he's a noted environmentalist and has wide ranging in research interests climate change, energy transformation, industrial pollution. 
many other things. Uh, he was conferred the Ozone Award by the UN Environment in 2017. Welcome, Tanhushan. Thank you. And uh, Nitin Sethi, he's an independent writer and journalist. He has extensively written on and investigated the intersections of environment, energy, climate change, development, and the political economy. A winner of several international and national awards and fellowships, he has worked uh, at the Hindu, Business Standard, Times of India, Scroll, and the Down to Earth magazine. Uh, welcome to all our panelists. Uh, I'll hand over to Navroz now for a moderated discussion for about 40 to 45 minutes, Navroz. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Shibani. Um, and thank you all for, for uh, joining us uh, this evening. Uh, we have a really, really uh, uh, rich set of perspectives in this panel. And uh, one of the reasons we were really keen to have uh, Naina, Chandra, and Nitin is that they all sort of, uh, um, you know, you're not going to get milk toast mild views. You're going to get nice, strong opinions. And I think that's kind of what we want. So we would look forward to you engaging some of the ideas in this book. Um, let me just start by asking for one quick round of comments from all of you on the premise of the book. The premise of the book that we, it's time now for us to move from thinking about whether we engage climate change to how we engage climate change. Uh, is that something that sounds right to you, or is it just far too simple a formulation? Are there complicating factors that we need to be uh, aware of? Um, and what are those? And uh, you know, from your and maybe drawing on, on some of your perspectives uh, in the different communities that you work within, uh, it would be very helpful to get a sense of, uh, of uh, just a couple of minutes each on that overarching question. And maybe we'll just start from the end of the row and, and then work our way back. Okay. <clears throat> I think that's the only premise that is left now, frankly. For 30 years, uh, we have, our focus was on international negotiations. We looked at climate change from the lens of UNFCCC largely, and what was happening there. And uh, there was a fantastic research done by, I'm forgetting the name, on climate change reportage in media. And for 12 years, if you draw the graph, it used to peak in November, December. And for the rest of the year, there was nothing. So we looked at climate change from the perspective of international negotiations for 30 years, hoping that it will deliver. Uh, unfortunately, it has not. And now I believe that uh, if you believe in science, and I think uh, there is overwhelming need to believe in science as far as climate change is concerned, then the debate is how do we move ahead? The debate is not to look back what has happened for 30 years, but now be pragmatic and think what are the new formulations, new development models, and new way to grow as well as address climate change. Because also, frankly speaking, if uh, there is a body of, uh, of economists and thinkers who believe that we can have degrowth to solve climate change, that's also not going to happen. And especially that debate will not fly in a country like India. So I think the premise of the book is the only debate, I believe, uh, that is there for us to engage uh, in a constructive manner, uh, taking into consideration. I'm really excited uh, to look at the chapter which looked at labor issues. We had not uh, thought in terms of labor. And you know the issue of just transition in, in eastern part of India, what would happen to coal mining. Those are the kind of discussion we need to start having instead of saying that, no, we will continue with coal. So as I, that's my opening remark. But that's the premise, a pragmatic premise on which we have to move ahead. Uh, so from my perspective, uh, I think what is most exciting is the way companies and uh, financial investors are embracing this subject. And I think of the early days uh, at, uh, say, the World Economic Forum, where these sessions saw the usual suspects. You know, we would sort of roll up. It was this, the development community. And uh, industry just wasn't there. And as many of you know, the World Economic Forum is really an industry event. So we used to gather under a tent on the sort of uh, uh, edges of what is happening. And in a period of about uh, three to four years, that discourse changed to 
these discussions being central, uh, that uh, companies sometimes struggling to understand the subject, but often being driven to understand it. And let me give you examples. Uh, so banks such as mine, HSBC, I think very much at the forefront of some of these discussions and has spent a lot of money in uh, the climate change space, uh, looks at risk and the way it's embedded in companies and how are they addressing climate change. And it is a risk. I mean, whether it's adaptation, mitigation, you, could, you have to look at the risk aspect of climate change when you lend. The minute you as a bank begin to look at it, you begin to force the company you're lending to to look at it. So finance begins to change the wheels of the way industry begins to address these subjects. A second area which has been very interesting is sovereign funds. Uh, you've seen how Norway, it's quite interesting at this stage in its history, having grown on fossil fuel, it now rejects it completely, will not invest in anything. And it's a very big sovereign fund. I mean, they hold like 3% in a global company like Nestle. And they are saying, hey, we want to hear from you at the board. What is it that you're doing in terms of sustainability, climate change, emissions, mitigation, etc." cetera? So at all this stage, they haven't said, we won't invest in you. But let me tell you that you can feel that threat. So global money is changing the way companies have to look at this. And so you've got that pressure building. And I think that amazing power of finance, global finance, will drive a lot of this change because you need that money either invested through the stock markets or through the banks to enable you to grow. Now, the other side of it, the good news is, I mean, we do have companies that are embracing this really well. Uh, uh, you know, companies like Google and others are actually saying they're going to, uh, they're already there in terms of going green by the end of the year, often defined just in terms of using renewable energy, sometimes in terms of carbon footprint. But there's an element of pride that is emerging in terms of the, the way companies look at this going forward. Uh, Indian companies uh, are signing up uh, to disclosure norms. And uh, the good news, again, is it, it's always the big guys. Uh, but we are seeing some attention coming from the MSMEs, who are typically the laggards, may need a little more investing by way of capital. But the, they come along largely because they're part of a supply chain to the big guys. So the big guys are saying, hey, I would prefer to buy from a visiting card company who makes the visiting cards who can tell me they're sustainable. And I'm OK to give you 10% more price for it. So you begin to drive change in your supply chain as a company. And that drives the MSME, SME sector to change as well. And that is happening. Right. And so what we've got is, I think, a very interesting change happening where finance and business is getting it. But it's not happening fast enough. And I think if we can push that agenda uh, harder, faster, Sometimes companies that are sort of sitting on the fence but not clear quite what to do, we can change it. And I would lastly say that the role of the CSO, the Chief Sustainability Officer, which often stat, sat in the CSR department and was sort of, OK, a tick box exercise. I have one. Uh, I'm on the global board of Lafarge Holtzim, and we just appointed the CSO to the executive board. So she sits right under the CEO alongside the regional heads for North America, Asia, et cetera, and is a key business driver for the company. And uh, you know, you've know, you got a company now that is in building products, in cement, which has a very big carbon footprint, saying, hey, I need to address this. Right. And here's how I'm going to begin to look at it in terms of technology, change, innovation, and putting one, my best foot forward in terms of an individual who is getting the attention in the company. So I think your book, and I was just reading your uh, chapter, uh, which Mukund Rajan and uh, Shankar had written, and uh, it picks up on a lot of these issues. So thank you for making sure that the voice of industry and finance is very much in there. And labor, of course, for just transitions becomes very important. Yeah. Great. Nitin, maybe you can comment on this. And, 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 and you know, also, I'd, I'd love to hear your sense of whether, you know, as Chandra said, this is a conversation, this framing perhaps is now inevitable. And, and uh, Nena said that, you know, the business community has picked this up. 
are there people who will be challenged by this formulation, who will lose from this rush to, to sort of elevate climate change? What, you know, what's your take on it? I mean, uh, let me refer back to your book itself. I think the premise you're making, or you're putting forth, uh, the authors themselves have gone far beyond that in some way, and that's why it's a fascinating book. The stresses and strains of how this would happen, I think, are evident in both uh, sections on policy, sections on international governance, sections on technology transfers. There's still, I mean, those examples and even the disagreements of how to go about it. Where do you make your challenges of investments in technology? Which horses to back, which not to back? What kind of risk-taking behavior can you undertake in a regime which is still an emerging economy, which cannot, at this stage, I mean, looks hilarious, cannot even manage a three-year economic cycle, but you would expect it now to manage a 40-year cycle of risk-bearing. I think those exist. In, I think all the stresses that you see in authors, perhaps without saying so much, sometimes disagreeing with it or seeing the same thing from different perspective, it's rather evident here. Um, my challenge, I think, for us is not again about how we'll do it. We'll end up doing it even if we don't talk about it. I think it's very clear to us that most of us are moving in these directions, whether we use the phraseology of climate change or not. Mm. Um, I think one of the reasons that we've uh, not been able to understand that people are already addressing it with less or more capacities is that we still, when we map changes and actions and uh, reactions of society and governance to climate change, we still look for that international phraseology of what climate change is like resilience, adaptation, whereas the fact is most communities are, with or without the help of the state, managing that already. Uh, therefore, you'll find, say, Chandrabhushan's example of when this, I know this is Reuters study saying, journalists never cover climate change. But all year round, all Hindi and vernacular journalists would be covering droughts, <laughs> something happening to crops not happening. It's just that they don't use the word climate change. They're referring to almost the same things. So I think the greatest challenge in terms of policy is to find our own language when we say what are the challenges. When you converse to an administrator and say climate change, adaptation, 4% variation, SR4, obviously you're not going to get anywhere. How do you then convert this language into something an IS officer who, as you said, runs a line department who has a budget head that comes instead of March in August? How does he react or she react to that? Is to try and build a narrative that works in that language framework. Two, I do think there are far more greater risks than we acknowledge at the moment of how does we as one society uh, adapt new technologies? What is our risk-bearing capacity at that moment? In which direction can we take? How do we hedge and where do we invest our resources? There are still great contestations mm -hmm. considering what we do with public health, education, that we are moving towards more private dependence. Therefore, we clearly are right now, particularly in a phase where the state does not have adequate resources even compared to, say, three years ago. Now, at this juncture, do you say a simple game like, do you invest in... EV buses, do we invest infrastructure for EV cars? These are big choices somewhere because they drive you down for the next 15 years, just like you build different kinds of buildings. I do not think we're at that stage where we are grappling with this, either from the perspective saying this is development or from the perspective saying whether it's climate change or not, we're going to have to deal with these for energy security reasons as well. And the only bit I disagree with is I think these stresses within the domestic state would play out whether we had an international regime or not. Agreed. We would need to deal with them. Therefore, to conflate and say, because we have these in domestic challenges, we should re look at what we do internationally. Uh, to give you a parallel, perhaps, and uh, I mean, there are far more eminent people who would be able to talk on this. The way, say, India has dealt with issues of international labor standards, um, the way India has dealt with issues of international indigenous issues, rights of indigenous people. What India very often speaks internationally is very different than what it practices inside. Also, with the way it looks at why these uh, issues are used in the international arena, uh, what other nation states prefer or wish if they use it as non-tariff barriers, etc. So I think it's fine to have two different narratives, but to be aware they are two different narratives and they perhaps both equally serve the purpose of moving us towards a better mix of energy, environment, and development issues. Um, to presume that one should therefore find the same languages in both the domestic narrative and the international narrative 
I think that's a leap that no country has taken, okay. and perhaps there's no need to do that. It's actually a sophisticated method uh, that most countries have followed. Say, US has followed till President Trump came in. Uh, it's, it's collapsed now. Um, I would say India still has, and uh, this might sound odd, but I think India's got a far more sophisticated narrative since Prime Minister Modi's come, where he can actually internationally claim to have taken leadership. He can domestically have done enough to damage environment at the same time. He could have actually been in a tough position as far as the economics is concerned, yet seem to be a global leader. I mean, either out of lack of choices or otherwise, we have a, developed, a more complex narrative than, say, US has at the moment. Uh, how will it evolve in five years? Um, a large amount of that would be actually on a factor of whether this downturn that we see is right now just a cyclical one, or is it really a structural reform that we will look forward to. It could push in another set of directions, and I'll end with this. Perhaps, say for climate change, security, and issues of development, the sale of PSUs and saying, where do you go when you invest in infrastructure next by 10 years? Do you sell off all your PSUs, large, say, the containers, ships, the gas system, the oil systems? Do we dismantle them and move into the private sector? That would impact our climate change footprint, our adaptation processes much more, and we're not ready to deal with it at the moment. And I think those are the levels at which we need to reach to grapple that large macro decision that get taken to shape economy actually will have great consequences also on our environment, and we need to bring those together. So in that, your book, I think all your authors agree. It's how you do it and at what stage, which one will entangle more and which one will entangle less. I think there, there's view different views, and I think that's why the book is fascinating, because it allows and brings so much width of ideas. I wish, I mean, most of them were journalists, they would have written it far more brashly in disagreeing with each other. So people, readers will have to tease out and understand those differences more. But that's just the journalist in me speaking. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for that. I, I want to pick up on your, your comments about sort of a level of comfort with the, with the two different narratives, uh, domestic and international, maybe a little later in the conversation. Sure. And first pick up on something you said earlier and, and, and the other speakers also talked about, which is the phraseology. You said, you know, we shouldn't be now hanging on to the international phraseology. We need a different phraseology. And I, and I, and I would agree with that. Question is, what does that phraseology look like? So, so one of the things you said is that you know people report the newspapers report on climate change effectively report on climate change all the time when you're talking about drought and so on and so forth. And, but we have uh, Krishna Chutara in the room here from IIT, whose job it is to try and scientifically unpack which impact is a climate. Uh, what is the probability that a particular impact is climate related and not? And that so so and, and there's a very good chapter on that. It's sort of the cutting edge of climate science now. And the question is, is it is it OK to try and not untangle it, given that the effects are common? Or do we need to try and untangle it because the reasons are slightly different? So, and, and hence the multiple stressor sort of language. So if we have uh, uh, issues of floods, part of that certainly has to do with land use change patterns and Absolutely. so on. Uh, let's take farmer distress. That is a political issue in India now. But farmers don't make the link between their distress and the possibility that, if not now, then in the future, climate change will be part of adding to that distress. So I'd like to sort of uh, uh, maybe maybe uh, sort of uh, anybody who wants to take this on, but um, climate change is not going to be a voting issue, I think, in India for a long time. That is my my own personal sense. Well, as it already is. as climate change. Yeah. yeah. Your your point about the phraseology, right? Hmm. But the linkage to whether it's farmer distress, droughts, floods, and so on. Will, will will possibly be. I mean, put it this way, we've struggled to get air quality on the manifestos of governments. Uh, you know, climate change is just a line uh, here and there. In that context, how do we, what sort of phraseology do we need? What sort of linkage do we need with sectoral concerns of farmers, of miners, of fisher folk, and so on, in order to drive this into the political process? Uh, I, I'd really welcome some some discussion on, on that, and we can jump around here. We don't have to always start with. with okay, TV, so I'm happy to jump in here because uh, uh, I'm of the school where it's not critical that people uh, talk about climate change as climate change. It's a huge education. I see how, frankly, most faces glaze over when you know there she goes again about climate change. However, the minute you connect 
on water, on floods, on pollution, on urban infrastructure, things which impact climate change, there's resonance. And I am really excited by the huge awareness around pollution in the country. And it's really a sad statement, but you know, India, has, biggest change moments happen when we hit Nadir. And this is one of those. It happened in 91, we almost bankrupt, and India opened up to see some of its highest growth in economy ever. So you hit rock bottom, and hopefully you jump to that next generation. It happened in telecom, we waited two years for a landline, and today the mobile uh, uh, companies, are company, down. Well, <laughs> don't, they won't be alive. But, but in the process, yeah, in order to ensure penetration, of that mobile phone, driving cost and price down to the point where it's killing the companies. But what has it done? It's given everybody access, not just to mobile telephony, but also to internet. So I think what we are at is at a very exciting crossroads if we can jump onto it. Now, not everything with pollution is climate change, but there are, there are things that are, right? If you can move the brick kilns out of cities, you can look at the way your urban infrastructure and cities are constructed transportation and the way it links with the way you build and what you build. So these linkages and why are buildings important? Buildings become important because if you look at air conditioning infrastructure in the country and the fact that an air conditioner is an aspirational buy, and today if what you're seeing is a penetration of under 2%, I mean some of the projections in air conditions are frightening for the environment. So if we can have buildings which are cooling or built of cements that stay cool or materials which stay cool gives you less need to cool and look at the way that helps as you go forward. So as we look at pollution, and it's not just about stubble burning and farmers as we well know, and look at the, var the various spaces which you know the wonderful work that CSE has done has also shown us, and tackle each for what it is, we begin to find the solutions which tackle climate change without having to call it that. So what, as a practitioner, what I like to see is those easy to solve situations that emerge, which we can tackle, which we know impact climate change, but we don't have to call it that. However, having said that, what I would like to see is at a policy making level, there should be some degree of uh, homogen uh, homogenous thinking amongst the policy makers. And uh, I mean, Sham and I see this from the China end on one of the groups that we engage in as an India-China dialogue with the NCE. And the Chinese are so connected at the top. They've got this uh, group, their climate change group, with policy makers, uh, professors sitting at Tsinghua University, direct line to President Xi. We don't have that. So we have our climate change agendas sitting in so many different ministries that it doesn't actually come together somewhere. So at the planning policy end, it would be great to see it at one place with people who do call it climate change. But otherwise, I don't care. Maybe right. you want to come in on this? I think we are not realizing the qualitatively different level of challenge that climate change is. You know, generally when you talk to government in India, they'll tell you that historically we have gone through droughts and floods. So how different it is and we have coped with it. They'll also tell you that we have dealt with it by rainwater harvesting, uh, by doing water management, by getting different strain of crops. I think in this discussion we are missing the point the qualitatively different nature of climate change. Okay. This is not normal drought and flood. Okay. So even if journalists are writing drought and flood, the nature of drought and flood under the influence of climate change is very different. Okay. Now, for example, who would have believed that Mumbai would get flooded in November? Okay. So the qualitatively different nature of climate change and the challenge it poses on us demands a climate crisis language. Okay. It would have been fine 20 years back to say that 
ओके वी कैन यूज दिस को बेनिफिट टर्मिनोलॉजी कि एयर पोल्यूशन की भी बात कर लें तो क्लाइमेट चेंज सॉल्व हो जाएगा आई डोंट थिंक दैट लैंग्वेज विल वर्क नाउ ओके सो आई थिंक द लैंग्वेज विल हैव टू बी ए लैंग्वेज ऑफ क्लाइमेट क्राइसिस In fact, I don't like the term climate change. It is a very, very. It 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 actually reduces the challenge to to a very uh, almost like you know this this is fine. This is one of the environmental challenges. So I, in fact, would like to have a language which is much more a crisis language because we are facing a crisis. Uh, Krishna is here, and many of the author of 1.5 <coughs> and IPCC reports are here. Now. people have looked at the executive summary of ipcc report they have not gone into the details of the chapter and as i started by saying if you believe in science then they are frightening and some of those frightening things we are already witnessing uh, on the ground i mean to say think about it the kind of wildfire that is hitting australia right now if only california and australia wildfire emissions are added together i am talking about tipping point Okay, it will be equivalent to 10% of global emissions. Okay, just California and Australia, and our wildfire is also increasing. No one is talking about wildfire in Uttarakhand. Last year, we had the highest amount of wildfire. So I think we need to get out of this mindset that. Let me just end by saying it is a qualitatively different challenge and requires a qualitatively different language. Okay. and i don't think we should leave this language of uh climate crisis language has to be the language that we need to talk about if we want serious action on climate change i think it's very interesting to get this this the the these sort of two views and i'll just invite you in a second nitin but but it it it's uh, in my own engagement with this i found uh that in a sense we have been groping here in india towards taking the co benefits sort of language seriously it started out as a bit of a as a bit of a cover up you know that we will continue doing what we're doing along the way we will be able to harness some climate gains and we will report against them and in a sense we could those of us who are strategically placed could use that opportunistically when you needed a big sort of political uh, uh, push on some issue you could harness climate change because the pm had to go to a g20 meeting or there was some big visible and so you could i think that was sort of how the national solar mission in its earlier days and again ambassador sadan is the person uh, who who is best placed to speak to this there was that sort of language you could talk about climate change internationally you could talk about energy security domestically and you could leverage climate change to make useful things happen because in most countries people who work on environment are politically weak so climate change became a g20 issue that you could harness and we have only i think been making steps towards operationalizing that so when you look at these institutions chapter in the book there are all these cells in the ministry but they only have one or two people it's not like the china story so we are not very far down even operationalizing that view and we are being overtaken i think as chandra was saying my my sense is that we are being overtaken by this language of crisis and existentialism which can also lead to paralysis because then when you have a crisis language and you know that you're in a country with so many immediate pressing issues what what do you do how can you step on the accelerator and put aside all these pressing issues so so there's a tension here that you know i'm not really sure how how we resolve do you do you have any I'm thoughts on it i'm figure out why you invited me <laughs> cuz i'm going to be very contrary to this uh so so far is going according I'm to plan i'm going to use <laughs> exactly i kind of figured uh when is the last time we heard the word emergency in india forget climate um what did it do so let's understand the, that language itself has great politics in, inserted in it when you use a phrase like emergency or crisis you perhaps at that point require or suggest whoever uses that phraseology requires that a certain morality a certain set of ethics a certain idea of equality priorities be suspended for a while because there is something which is more urgent than anything else and this should be resolved and the rest can all then thereafter come together what it does is therefore suspend all notions of in india's case i think in cases of development notions of equity within us forget we fought this battle internationally but we not even begun fighting this uh, within the domestic barriers obviously particularly because of this pernicious and uh, 
abhorrent idea of caste that we've had for very long, which we've not been able to undo. Um, the moment you impose a notion of emergency, you say suspend everything because the only priority is let's reduce our emissions. And to that end, we will be the right people to decide the right things. And we shall have a clear, we have a clear clarity that you all do not have. We have reached a point where these five people can therefore have. And the state has used these phrases of emergency everywhere to dictate when there's friction between, say, different parties in the state or in communities. I see it in villages also. I come from an area where uh, the Gram Sabhas are actually working Gram Sabhas, where the Gaon Buddhas do not have power. Villages actually sit five nights if they have to decide whether the two pigs will be cut or one. Uh, the best way to resolve it is when the shaman comes in and says there's an emergency. And then the shaman takes over the powers over the society and therefore on behalf of the society takes agency and decides everything. It does uh, disempower people. Therefore, I think in India's case, at different levels, and I would react actually to the, your first reference to the science on accuracy of whether this is climate related or not, should we be talking to it, how much education is required on that. Sometimes it can work just to reverse. In fact, I would say largely because uh, this has been driven by the international funding that is coming through NGOs in India rather than actually a domestic desire. We've ended up covering absolute plain malgovernance in the name of climate change. Everything can now be excused in the name this is climate change. Because a lot of it is actually just plain bad malgovernance, which mm -hmm. maybe one can say at this stage of our economy, this is the best we can do. We should be improving, but if this is our per capita incomes, maybe we're slightly worse than a few countries, slightly better than the others. But roughly, if you look at that band, that's where we are functioning. We are a relatively bad democracy at the moment. We are relatively economically really haphazard. We do have large MSME labor outside the formal structures, which are not even mapped in our databases right now. We do not know of those lives that are lived. Practically, we do not know those lives lived either in our state records or in our narratives or in our understanding of what society is. On top of that, you then impose this very uniform idea of climate change driving everything. To me, that's more dangerous and perhaps more debilitating, as you said, perhaps it will, I mean, roughly you're saying the same thing, it will suspend action because it will force people to say, it's not in our hands. Let's just move off because we'll do our This is such a crisis and clearly it requires US and China and India to sit together and average villager has nothing to do with it. He or she will go about trying to manage with what they have because they still do not have their BPL cards in place or they're looking for another hard card somewhere. I think if you turn this around and say, do you talk about bond markets and interest rates to somebody who's going to the post office? You do not, but you know these things are linked. Now, why would I want to tell a villager who's going to go to a post office about bond markets equivalently? Why would I need to get into play absolute to sophisticated science when the actions he or she is required are very limited because the state has already made sure he or she does not have too many choices? The actions are to be taken by the state, not by the citizen in most cases. So you need to only educate the state, not the citizenry here. But when you want to talk to the citizenry, and, and I'm sorry, this is a very, um, it might sound odd, but there were two cases where we actually started looking at saying, how do say, I write, I write in English and how do I speak with other people when I want to talk on the same issue? So the first issue I picked up as a journalist was when we were talking Aadhaar, and we said, what's the phrase for privacy in different languages? You won't believe, most languages do not have a written phonetic phrase for privacy. But they have different connotations, they have different tonations, different reflections of it, which do not find their way into English or vice versa. The second phrase, which is very recent, I was, and this was hilarious, I was doing the series on electoral bonds, and I started collaborating with different languages and saying, will you republish? And this gentleman who's a, a, a priest who's trying to do a Khasi translation in Meghalaya said, you know, we just got into currency like 40 years ago. I don't even know what a bond is. Forget an electoral bond. Mm -hmm. When I describe it in Khasi, it takes me 90 words. Now, this is where we're coming from. This is why we need to understand what languages describe danger. How do you, in different languages, describe risk bearers? There is no phrase like risk bearers because in a community-driven structure, say in my community, the risk bearers is you will always have a cousin in the next village because when your village gets burnt, he or she is responsible to take care of your life till you can set up again. 
So that languages at different scales and the language that you speak to the state are essentially different. And my, again, I'll come back to this premise that this language of climate crisis or emergency, which is, I believe and clearly is evident, is again driven by international fund flows, is really risky to import into India without looking at its consequences socially and anthropologically or not. Can I just come in on this? Yeah. Okay. So, so, so yes, of course, but just two minutes because I want to do one more round okay. and then get the audience in. But okay. yes, you should, you should have your Okay, I ju just want to say this, that it is not either or or. Mm -hmm. It's like, do not use climate change and do not use climate crisis. Okay, I, I don't think that's the narrative that we are dealing with here. Now, when I say climate crisis, does it mean climate emergency and paralysis in the government? The answer is no. But when I use, when I'm saying that we should use a crisis narrative, is to actually tell people who believe that we have dealt with climate change for 100 years. Okay, that's the narrative that is inbuilt in, in in our government. That's the narrative which most people believe. Frankly speaking, if you, I did an article called Cl "Closet Climate Denier." Okay, internationally you go and say I believe in climate change, but inside the room you say what is climate change? We have dealt with it for 100 years. Okay. There is this flippant attitude in India that needs to be recognized. Okay. Now, the fact is that till we recognize that climate change is hurting our economy, is killing people, and is going to do undo everything that we have so-called development we have done for 30 years. Okay. Then I said we, we made economic growth from, from 1990 uh, onwards or whatever growth, and even undo the equity that we are talking about. Well, equity we talk a lot, but frankly, Nitin, as Nitin also rightly said, what we do domestically is very different. But the fact is, many of the things that we aspire for is going to be undone by climate change. Go and meet people below the flyover of Delhi, and you will see the face of climate change. Okay. Go and see who lives and sleeps below the flyovers in the evening. Most of them, during summer, will migrate from Rajasthan. Okay. That's the migrating crowd that comes. Many of them will come from Churu. Okay. And there's very simple reason. Churu doesn't have water. The temperature exceeds 50 degrees. They don't have anything to do. They come here. Okay. How many of you are, we are talking about climate change migration within the country itself? Okay. So I think the crisis narrative is not meant to paralyze the government. The crisis narrative is to impress on the fact that you cannot remain a closet climate denier anymore. That's the point I want to make. Can I still do it, or do you want to? I, 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 hold? I, I think sure. we might want to. Absolutely. You, you know, you're skillful enough to work it into the subsequent uh, yeah. uh, comments. So, uh, that was nice. <laughs> everybody on this panel is not just you, Nitin. So, so I'm, I'm sure you'll, you'll, you'll manage. Um, but I, I would like to open it up, um, and and let me just let me just. Uh, you know, as a, as, a, as a bridge, what we did in this book was saying you have to start with where you are, which is that you have a government machinery and you have epistemic communities around agriculture, around water, around energy, around urbanization, and so on. So those are the conversations. And I think here there's sort of a distinction a little bit between, to use the climate terminology, the adaptation versus the mitigation discussion. When you're talking about adaptation, and we've had, Veena and I have had extensive conversations in the context of water. Right now, the water crisis in India is probably not a climate change crisis. But there is little doubt, in my mind at least, that in the future it will be. So how do you simultaneously address the crisis you have in front of you and make sure that you're not planning for incremental increases in the crisis proportions, but actually qualitatively different future crises? All of this is a very difficult governance thing to balance. Uh, so we're not able to handle our day-to-day -day situation, let alone how we're going to see sort of amplified effects uh, on climate change. So, so I, I, you know, I'm sympa very sympathetic, actually, to, 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 to both these sort of perspectives uh, on it. And I think what's also interesting is that both sides are saying, if you start with the poorest and most vulnerable in India, you know, starting from that point of view, both the climate perspective, emergency perspective, as well as starting with the here and now, 
those are the people who actually will bear the brunt, uh, you know, whatever your entry point to that, that conversation is.